Thanks a lot for the introduction, um, and thanks to you, uh, to you all for showing up this early after the party yesterday. I know it's hard. Um, so let's start with the beef. What did we do? Oh, I think I have to say here better. So what did we do? Um, this might look familiar for those of you who know the, um, for example, the HoloLens, like we just mentioned. Um, this is a typical interface uh, that all of you will have seen so far in your careers. That's like a head-centered user interface, at least that's what I call it. You usually have some kind of interface elements popping up right in front of you, and then you have to do something like this very intuitive click thing from the whole lens, you know, things like that. What we propose is um, something a little bit different. Instead of, um, you know, popping up icons right in front of you, we propose that you ha should have some icons centered around the joints of your body, so more like a body-centered approach and not just a head-centered visual approach. Um, so why did we do this? Well, let's start a little bit with the vision here. Uh, I think most of you have seen this uh, movie or at least part of a movie in uh, some of our presentations before. So the vision is that we want some kind of natural user interface which is very stunning, you know, it should work for a long time span, allowing people to do creative uh, or constructive work for a long time span. Um, at least I would like to see people working maybe 15 years every day for maybe eight hours uh, with some kind of natural uh, 3D user interface or spatial user interface. However, to be honest, most of them still kind of do feel like this, so they end up being relatively painful after a short time span. Um, so we did come a long way. If you look at uh, Google's Tilt Brush, I mean, it's, in my opinion at least, the closest thing we have to the ultimate display. Uh, so we can really step into a virtual world. We can create things. You know, it's very uh, intuitive. So we've come a long way. We also have fantastic devices which allow us to do tracking without any kind of instrumentation like on the body so we can use the Kinect and here you have Microsoft uh, the hand pose project they allow you to really track efficiently hands potentially you can uh, track the whole body without some kind of motion capturing suit like you used to need a couple of years ago so again we've come a long way However, there's still some research questions which, you know, are mostly hardware dependent. So there's limitations there which we have to account for as researchers, and of course, um, well, designers have to account for this, uh, for this when they are developing their applications. Um, so we have this versions accommodation conflict, which is a huge problem for uh, head mount displays. We have like. Um, no occlusion when we're working with um, some kind of cave setups. We don't really have good working haptic feedback, although, um, for example, my colleague uh, and others are working on solutions for this part with actuators and things like that. Um, so there's still some issues that we have, uh, but one issue which a lot of people don't account for is the comfort for these interfaces. So, uh, you know, this is just you know an illustration for the gorilla arm syndrome. If you are not aware what this is, I invite you to lift your arm in a non-offensive pose and you know leave it like that for maybe 10, 20 minutes, and you will see that it really hurts after a while. And uh, to be honest, a lot of the user interfaces which uh, even some of us have developed uh, before really cause some arm strain or something like that. So you really get this kind of gorilla arm syndrome of your arms hurt after a time span after using these uh, interfaces. Um, compared to a classical desktop setup where you have a keyboard and a mouse, ideally this should not happen as quickly, and I think we have a long way to go until we have interfaces which um, work as well for a long time span. So we also did some previous research in this field. Uh, on the left you see like a heat map. So we asked um, our students to uh, really hold their uh, hand in a specific position around them uh, for a long time span and to let them evaluate subjectively um, you know, their uh, comfort rating for this. Um, as you can see, there was some area in front of the user which they deemed to be the most comfortable one. And based on this research and some other previous research of ours, um, we did a little experiment where we uh, evaluated whether like comfort, uh, in this case, based uh, on an armrest, has a real influence on the performance in to, uh, 3D selection tasks. And we did actually find a significant influence of this 
a simple armrest, in this case the table, um, on, the influen uh, on the selection performance. Um, and I think we were actually one of the first groups that actually show, uh, has shown an influence or correlation of uh, comfort levels with the selection performance uh, in this case. Um, so when I'm talking about selection performance, I'm talking about mostly Fitt's Law and the throughput of Fitt's Law. And um, you've heard it a couple times in this conference already, so I'm not going to go into detail there. However, I want to mention that uh, previous research, especially uh, Wolfgang and Rob, they have shown that uh, this actually is valid for 3D as well, so it's not just valid for 2D tasks. Um, you can also use it for three-dimensional tasks. Um, now, for the... Well, important things, for well, the newer things, we have some related work here, which is concerned with the positioning of interface elements around, um, around the user and, more importantly, around the user's uh, joints. In this case, you have um, lease work. Uh, there are virtual shelves, and they're using the orientation sensor of a mobile device uh, and positioned the objects um, really around the shoulder, around the user, so they could like access it relatively quickly. Um, we also have some other uh, related work here uh, from the Baylor HCI group. Um, they are actually uh, investigating the whole comfort uh, and 3D user interface thing as well. Um, and you can see here that we're work working with Amayo, and they also investigated like whether um, having some armrests or not uh, does have an influence on the whole, um, yeah, on the whole selection performance. They also did a uh, Fitz Law task. However, they map the whole thing on spherical coordinates. Uh, again, the, um, in this case, the targets, they were positioned around uh, or on spheres around the user's joints. Um, so you, I think you should see, uh, see a pattern here. Uh, also, I uh, found out that Bar uh, Barrett uh, also did a work which is quite similar where they had uh, interface elements positioned uh, in a personal cockpit also around the user. Again, something spherical. And when we did some more research or investigation in the field of uh, human factors or ergonomics, we found out uh, there is, uh, of course, knowledge about how human joints work. And you can actually, if you stretch your finger out, uh, trace a partial sphere with most your joints. So if you uh, just stretch your finger out and move it around, you will be able to trace a partial sphere with your shoulder joint. Uh, if you place your elbow on a table, you will also be able to trace a partial sphere. Um, and the same thing happens uh, for the wrist. You can also trace like uh, things uh, like a partial sphere again. And we call these things kinospheres. This is a term from, I think it was uh, dance theory, so a little bit off topic here. However, uh, this kind of works for us. Um, so what we think uh, is the advantage of these um, is simply that if you keep your finger outstretched, um, you kind of reduce the dimensionality of a problem. So um, most of the uh, problems we have in, in those special use interfaces are really connected to depth perception, um, which is obviously still a problem. Um, and to reduce this, we kind of want to get rid of a depth dimension. And by placing objects on a sphere, uh, or on a high plane, if you prefer, um, we can actually reduce this. At least that was uh, one of our hypotheses uh, in this case, um, that we can really place objects on this sphere and thus maybe increase the performance and perhaps also increase the comfort levels um, of the user interface. However, you know, we are not robots, so keeping your hand outstretched perfectly might not be the ideal case. Um, so we decided we need to actually investigate more than just placing items like on a sphere and see if it works. We have to check uh, what the exact distance between the joint and the, um, the objects should be on a sphere. So we investigated various distances. Uh, you know, we took the golden ratio and uh, determined these uh, distances here. Um, they are um, adapted or calibrated to the user's arm length or joint length. Um, or joint distances, uh, I mean. And um, we investigated like uh, various ones. So we had a short, a medium, and a long distance. And also we um, decided we should maybe uh, create a more advanced case. We called it snapping a boundary condition between the medium and um, the long distance. Um, 
where actually the finger position was mapped on perfectly onto a sphere. So as soon as, as the finger was within the boundary, it would uh, we completely took out the depth dimension and mapped it perfectly onto one of our kinospheres. Um, so we conducted two experiments. Um, the first experiment was the one with distances I just described. It was within subjects repeated measures. Um, then we uh, investigated three joints, so the shoulder, the elbow, and the wrist joint. Uh, the four distances I just mentioned, we also took four uh, indices of difficulty and uh, did three repetitions, uh, which resulted in about 45 minutes in an HMD. You know, if you want to investigate comfort, you should design experiments which are a little bit longer so people actually get a little bit of a strain in their arm or not, you know, if you designed it well. So we had 20 participants, um, mostly they were uh, employees or uh, students of our HCI or computer science department. And uh, the setup was relatively simple. We had infrared tracking with a PVT tracker. We tracked it with the, uh, we tracked the DK2, so the head. Um, we had a non-dominant head for confirmation of a selection. Uh, this is usually something where people start discussing. Uh, we used this uh, confirmation with a non-dominant hand to avoid hand tremors, especially when you have um, very small selection processes um, with the wrist condition, for example, of the hand tremors, you know, the jitter you have in your hand might cause some problems when you press a button with your uh, hand that you are using for the selection also. So we use the non-dominant hand for this. And the various conditions, uh, here you can see the actual recording of, of one of our participants, uh, this is the, the shoulder condition with a short distance. Obviously, the arm has to be a little bit, um, you know, it's not stretched out, but it's a little bit closer, but she doesn't rest her arm anywhere. Um, we also have the elbow condition. You see she's resting uh, the arm on a cushion on the table there, and uh, we also have the wrist condition. Um, same thing here. Uh, this was, of course, changed for the uh, dominant hand, so if we had some left-handed participants, we would just change this. Um, Quickly, just one short part of the um, uh, quantitative uh, results. Uh, you see here uh, the throughput, so the most important uh, result that we get from a Fitz law task. And uh, we found out that uh, so the joint actually was uh, significant, so the, the joint uh, condition caused a significant effect on uh, the selection performance and the distance as well. And um, they were not just significant, they also had like a uh, high effect strength for the whole thing. Um, so again, we confirmed the result that a more comfortable thing, you know, by having a, an armrest, especially when the wrist was used, uh, although the index of difficulty was the same, so it was accounted for. Um, actually, having this comfortable interface allows you to have a higher performance as well. Um, so again, we have the correlation. We also ask a bunch of uh, subjective questions, so we asked the users to really rate all the various um, uh, conditions. You see a wrist of medium distance was apparently the one that most people preferred. Um, a little bit of a condensed version uh, you can see here. And surprisingly, we found out why the boundary condition was preferred. Obviously, they liked the snapping, it made the whole task easier. Uh, the dong distance was not liked too much, and the medium distance was actually preferred. So um, for the discussion, we just uh, were relatively sure that this long kinematic change uh, causes fatigue. So if you have to really stretch out your uh, kinematic chain, this is a straining process, obviously not comfortable. Um, and this, the short distance is also relatively uncomfortable because it was simply too close, so they had to like bend their arm too much over a finger, uh, depending on the condition. Um, so we deemed that the boundary, so if we have a possibility to create some kind of snapping condition, we should use the boundary condition or just use a medium uh, distance between the joint and the interface elements. We also did a confirmatory study. Um, this time it was not Fitz Law because I really didn't want to do another Fitz Law task. Instead, we had just a subjective 
uh, questionnaires in this case and a little bit of an application which we built. So we had a little bit of an interior architecture application. Uh, the setup was uh, counterbalanced. It was again within subject. Um, and we compared the uh, interfaces, which I have shown the first couple slides. So we had the head-centered interface, where the interface elements would pop up in front of the user's head, and uh, the joint-centered user interface, and they were counterbalanced um, to uh, get rid of any kind of uh, yeah, effects in there. Uh, what we did measure was um, we had the Borg scale of uh, perceived exertion, um, which is you know, from medical kind of uh, papers. We had the NASA TLX, which most of you should be familiar with, and the simple usability scale from Bro Brook, um, which all the users had to fill in um, after the um, HMD phase. This time it was uh, only about 20 minutes long. We uh, were a little bit in time struggle to get it done for the conference, uh, so we made it a little bit shorter. Uh, the setup was quite similar to the first one, so again, we used the PPT tracking system. Um, we did not use a Kinect. I investigated it with a Kinect. However, the jittering caused by the tracking was not adequate to really be used for uh, anything that had to do with uh, tracking fingers uh, precisely. So unfortunately, we could not use the Kinect for this. Um, so we did what we had, and we had the PPT system. Uh, meaning we could track, of course, the HMD, and we had to track the single joints with, uh, with a little uh, marker on, on each joint. So we had a joint on the elbow, on the wrist, and on the finger we had um, our uh, HAP ring, uh, which is a device uh, built with my colleague. Um, it also offers like an infrared LED for tracking, but it also had a joystick for the input, allowing us to really confirm uh, selections in the interface that we did. Uh, the whole thing uh, looked like this. Um, so uh, what you can see on the bottom is uh, what the user saw, and uh, on the top you see the user basically moving around. We were comfortable in an emperor uh, chair, um, and the first couple tasks were very simple. You had to move a table and something like that, so you didn't even get to see any uh, interface elements popping up. And then later on, like you just saw here, uh, you had to change the colors of the walls, of the, the ceiling, the floor. You had to uh, move like the couch, and the couch has more modi, so it can be moved, but it can also change the colors. So you would have to have a selection to, uh, uh, to really determine the context you want to use. Uh, and always the items would pop up in the middle of, uh, of the screen or right in front of the user, and they had to reach up in front and uh, touch these uh, buttons. Now, um, the second condition was the joint-centered one. Uh, again, we did the same thing with moving the object first, and uh, then they had to do a color selection. And you can see how the uh, UI adapts depending on the user's arm position, whether they have the joint uh, rested or not. Uh, the interface uh, adapts, so basically it pops up accordingly. It moves a little. Um, so when you're tired of using uh, your shoulder to control everything, you can just put your elbow down and the interface elements would snap up to be close to your finger. Um, so for the results, as I said, we had just had subjective questions in, in this case. Um, basically, we had the source, the, the simple usability scale, so higher is better in this case. You see it's a little bit higher, however, it was not significant, unfortunately. Um, the TLX, uh, a little bit sim uh, similar, so lower is better in this case. A little bit of a lower task load, however, not significant. I assume if we had like 10 more participants, it would have been significant because it was like a trend in there. Uh, and we had the box scale, and this actually did show what we wanted to show, that the joint standard user interface is actually um, more comfortable, so it doesn't create uh, as much exertion. Um, so lower is better here, and this was a significant result. Um, for all these things, um, the, uh, we actually measured like uh, a medium effect strength of the uh, user interface we, which we used. So uh, for the discussion, um, what we wanted to see was basically that the perceived exertion would be lessened if we're using joint-centered interfaces. So this is certainly something that we did see in this experiment. We've we shown that this is the case. Um, in the first experiment, we've shown again that the joint-centered user interface can offer a higher performance. This is also a good thing. Uh, it is not really less demanding, as I said. We would have to redo the experiment, maybe make it a little bit longer, um, something like that. But 
Um, what we did get as a feedback from our participants was uh, very simple. Obviously, this joint centered user interface is not always visible. If you have the interface elements right in front of you, you see them, obviously. If they are at your joint, you don't always look like to the bottom right or bottom left, you know. So uh, they are not always visible, which makes it harder to learn. So it requires some kind of learning period. So the final thoughts would be uh, for long-term use, if you're planning to build an interface which, is, uh, which has to be used for a long time span, which obviously means that you have some kind of uh, time to get used to the interface, we would suggest you use this adaptive, comfortable joint-centered user interface if possible, you know, if you need some kind of context changes where you need uh, user interface elements like buttons. For short-term use, however, just keep using the head-centered at once. If you're only using this interface for five minutes, you don't need to worry about comfort as much. You know, if you just want to show someone like the HoloLens, it's so awesome, look at it. Um, you know, they don't need to learn that, okay, the interface elements are around your fingers. You know, it takes a little bit more of an introduction, makes it a little bit more uh, difficult to explain. Um, and that's it, actually, this way. Thanks for your attention. Any questions? <laughs> there are any questions for Paul? Please come on up to the microphone. Okay, so while, um, while people are, are thinking, I have, uh, have one for you. So um, I noticed there's an interesting overlap here with um, your uh, joint centered interfaces and the, uh, the thumbs up work that we saw yesterday presented by Khaled. Uh, where you had a kind of a thumb joint based thing. So I'm just wondering if you had thought about uh, finger joints and, and these could be kind of a fourth category of... Yes, of yes. Well, we did in fact think about this. Um, one of the reasons why we didn't do it in the end was simply that the tracking uh, is not necessarily accurate enough if you're using the AV infrared tracking. However, it can be, this joint centered approach can be adapted to finger based interface. Obviously, if you uh, position like the joint, in this case, just, uh, you know, on the base of your finger, you can also move it on a partial sphere. It is much smaller than for the shoulder or for the uh, elbow, but it would technically work. Um, we didn't use it because, you know, the hardware was not up, up to it. Uh, I'm still waiting, like, for Connect 3 or some a special version of Elite Motion, which has more accuracy uh, to do this. So we just, you know, we're not hardware de developers, so we didn't do it in this case. Okay, so it's next on the agenda. Yes. <laughs> um, so uh, one, uh, one more thing is I'm wondering if you had thought about, uh, with the different uh, joint possibilities, uh, it's, it's, uh, this is very interesting work. I find it's a very, it's a real, like, human-centric way of developing an interface uh, in a very uh, literal context. Thanks. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering, have you put some thought into... Uh, different applications and where these uh, different joints might be useful for different contexts or different applications? Um, I would argue that in any case where you need some kind of context change, for example, you are not you want to decide whether you really want to move this couch or you know something like or color it, uh, you get kind of a choice and then you need to have some kind of interface. So I would say for this case, um, However, um, we are now working with, with another university and they are actually people who build hardware and they are building like exoskeletons which support you on the long, long run and I think um, perhaps it would be possible to adapt this kind of joint-centered approach if you are, have some kind of physical support which you carry around you know, for real long-term uh, use. Um, we could maybe adapt this for some more cases like I don't know, engineering or something like that. So, still work in progress. <laughs> okay, great stuff. Uh, do we have any more questions for Paul? Last call. All right, thanks, Paul. Thanks a lot. Um,